when Kevin asked me to speak, we talked about how this is really chronic disease in the internet age. But the more I thought about it, and thought about the research that the Pew Internet Project is doing, I thought that maybe a better title for the talk would be Healthcare Out Loud. Because that's what we're seeing in our data. Whether we're looking at news, politics, healthcare, or other sectors, people are using the internet to gather together and share information. And more and more, they're gathering together and sharing information in a way that um, is, is moving the conversation to a new level. Basically, we're moving these conversations online and offline, and it's becoming healthcare out loud. Now, what, what I like to remember is that in 1995, which was really not that long ago, only one in 10 American adults had access to the internet. You can see in the slide that we're now up to 75% of American adults, and about 95% of teenagers. What's not on this slide is um, the data that we have just looking at health status as an indicator. 81% um, of adults who report no chronic disease go online, compared to 62% of adults who live with one or more chronic disease. And it actually drops down to 52% for those who are living with two or more chronic diseases. Um, and when I'm talking about chronic disease, um, that is in a 2008 survey we conducted where we asked people if they are living with high blood pressure, heart condition, lung condition, diabetes, or cancer. This year, um, the 2010 survey, we included another question, which was any other chronic disease, because of course, there are so many other conditions and diseases. Um, in the world, and 17% uh, of respondents said yes to that. In the year 2000, only 5% of American homes had broadband. Uh, we're now up to two-thirds of American homes that have broadband. The reason why that's important is that dial-up users take part in an average of three activities per day. Broadband users take part in seven. Broadband is enabling the social web. What's also enabling the social web is mobile. We now find that 82% of American adults have a cell phone. Six in 10 go online wirelessly with a laptop or a mobile device. And what I'm thinking about now is how mobile was the final front in the access revolution. A mobile device is the internet for so many people. That is especially true of young people, recent immigrants, um, people living in low-income households. And those are audiences which are essential to um, health healthcare messaging. And so if your organization's information is not available on a small screen, then I would argue it's not available at all to those people who rely on a mobile device to get their information. Now, Pew Internet Research has also shown that mobile plus, plus broadband adds up to much more than just one plus one. Each one of these has a multiplier effect. If someone gets broadband, it multiplies what they do online. And the same thing is true with mobile. In fact, the Pew Internet Project has identified um, something that we're calling the mobile difference. What we find also is notice that lower line, the, the people who are 65 and older. Yes, they're grabbing headlines, but they're still way behind people in their 20s. So when you're figuring out how to reach people, remember that there are still significant differences when it comes to social networking online. So what we find is that when somebody has a mobile device, they're more likely to gather information online to share information and to create information. What we're seeing is that mobile makes things personal and mobile makes things immediate. Mobile enables healthcare out loud. Um, so when we look at the number of people who are using social network sites to gather and share health information, you might be wondering, this can't be good people must be trading inaccurate information. And that probably is the number one question that I get from reporters. Um, when I talk about my data, they always break in and say, but, but what about all the bad information out there? And so in every healthcare survey that we conduct, we ask a question. 
Have you or someone you know been helped by information found online? 60% of internet users say yes, they or someone they know have been helped by the health information they found online. We also ask the opposite question. Only 3% of internet users say that they or someone they know have been harmed. This was um, 2008 data. This was an increase in the percentage of those who were helped from 31% in 2006 to 60% in 2008. And we just came out of the field with the 2010 survey, and the line is consistent. Um, we are seeing that the internet is more likely to be helping people than harming people. So the opportunity is to take advantage of a mobile difference, but also a diagnosis difference. When we looked closely at internet users who are living with chronic disease, we found that they are um, actually, when we control for age, when we control for all the other factors that go along with chronic disease, we find that living with a chronic disease actually makes someone more likely to contribute to the online conversation, makes it more likely to blog. And I think there's a significant opportunity for people who want to reach these target populations which are not necessarily online, but once you get them online, they take to it like fish to water, just like everyone else. And we really, frankly, shouldn't be surprised by this because this is an ancient human instinct to want to share, um, to want to learn from each other. And um, our latest health survey, which was once again conducted um, with help from the California Healthcare Foundation. Um, I, I can't share all the data now, um, but I, I do feel compelled to share um, one question which was inspired by some research conducted by Dr. Tom Ferguson. He was the founder of ePatients.net, um, and he was my mentor. He asked patients who were living with a serious condition to tell him which advisors were the best at diagnosis, health professionals or their online support group, which was the equivalent of ACOR or patients like me, but this was, again, more than 10 years ago. Which were the best at providing emotional support? Which were the best at providing day-to-day -day tips about how to deal with symptoms? Our national survey results match Tom's pioneering work. Nine out of 10 patients say health professionals are more helpful than fellow patients, friends, and family when it comes to getting an accurate medical diagnosis. Only 5% of American adults say that fellow patients, friends, and family are more helpful for a diagnosis. The picture shifts when we ask about emotional support in dealing with a health issue. Fellow patients, friends, and family are the much more popular choice. This was true at the beginning of the internet, and it's true now. When we look at the practical advice of dealing with day-to-day -day issues, that's what surprised me, actually. Um, it's an even split in our national survey. We find that um, people are, are equally likely to say that professional sources like doctors and nurses are good at providing those day-to-day -day coping tips um, as our friends, family, and other expert patients. For example, one person wrote in an online survey we conducted last year, I love to be able to talk to others who know how bad depression can be from their own experiences. By contrast, another e-patient does not find the community aspect of online health information to be useful, writing, I don't find chat rooms helpful because most people are sharing how horrible they feel, and I am beyond that. I have bad days, but I feel dragged down when I whine about them or listen to others talk about their problems with doctors, family, et cetera. I don't have those problems. This person uses the symptom and medication tracking tools available on the site, finding utility in sharing of a different sort. Now, when I was reading the online survey results, I actually found that comment really refreshing because there's this misnomer, this, this wrong idea that 
um, e-patients are all about sharing and emotional support. And what I actually hear over and over in my research from um, both patients and patient community leaders, whether it's .org.com, they say, you know what? We're about science. We're about making people better. We're not about hugs. And uh, in both cases, whether, whether you are gaining emotional support from other people who share your condition, or whether you're gaining information about which medication does the best job with your condition, those are both what I would call healthcare out loud. That's participatory medicine. Um, but then again, there's a secret ingredient to health, and it's love. Love is the reason why people want to stay healthy. It's why they want to stay well. And I would argue that it's why a lot of people um, feel compelled to share. They feel compelled to share um, and give each other emotional support. And they feel compelled to share and track their observations of daily living. And they feel compelled to share and track how a medication treats them as an individual so that others can learn from it because of love, because we want to help each other. I would argue that that is the secret ingredient to health. So think about what would happen if we could harness this instinct to share with the tools that make it easy. Think about what would happen if we could harness love for better health care. About 20% of the online health population has posted comments online, contributing to the online conversation, which is the classic Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, that 80% of the audience is listening and 20% is talking. But what I find really interesting is that when you hand somebody a mobile device, they're more likely to become a contributor. They're more likely to comment. They're more likely to um, use a status updating service like Twitter or Facebook. They are more likely to participate in the online conversation. Mobile access bumps up participation. So what's going to happen when every patient and every caregiver and everyone who has something to share actually has the ability to share it. For me, that's the next frontier in healthcare transformation. It's not about access, it's about uploads. It's about inputs, it's about learning, and it's about love. Human beings want to share they want to help each other. They want to connect with the best medical advice available. And yes, they want hugs. That's chronic disease in the internet, in the internet age, and that's healthcare out loud. Thank you.